in this age of open source, what we call the open source era, um, issues relating to the use of open source software in supply chains have come to the forefront. And on the one hand, of course, OSS, as we call it for short, open source software, offers immense opportunities for ICT developers worldwide and reducing the cost, right, um, the expenditures in supply chain. But that's, I mean, that's all well and good. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is that um, it is highly prone to cyber attacks as well and therefore can become a weak link. And this is a topic that we're going to be discussing today. Um, the latter is, of course, um, further aggravated by the fact that um, there's ambiguity regarding who can be held responsible, who should be held responsible for addressing the vulnerabilities in OSS. So today, um, we have got an amazing panel, really representatives from different stakeholders group. Um, I'm going to get them to sort of you know, introduce themselves um, briefly before they make each of their opening remarks. Um, but some of the things that we're going to be discussing today is the role of regulation in securing the use of OSS and supply chains. Um, that's going to be in the spotlights. You know, what makes supply chain attacks via vulnerabilities and open source software more difficult to mitigate? We'll also talk about, you know, when the code belongs to everyone who exactly is and can be held responsible for its security. And of course, um, what are some of the regulatory approaches that we can take um, to ensure cybersecurity of OSS in cyber supply chains? So um, with that, I'm actually going to call on Craig um, to start and you know start the ball rolling and maybe you know um, speak to us a little bit more about the cybercrime um, scene and you know including some scenarios involving supply chain attacks that you may want to share. Craig. Thanks very much, Jeannie, and thanks for uh, Kaspersky, uh, one of our public-private partners under Gateway, which we'll probably come on to a little bit later, uh, for having us all here and supporting uh, this event. So, Craig Jones, um, I'm a senior law enforcement official from the United Kingdom. I'm seconded into Interpol since 2019, so I turned up in Singapore just before COVID. Good start. Um, and my role is the director of a global cybercrime program, so 195 member countries. Um, our role there is to reduce the global impact of cybercrime and protect communities for a safer world. No small task. We work as a neutral interlocker, um, so we can work into all countries. Anything that's uh, political, military, religious or racist, we can't be involved in. It has to be crime. So it makes the job in some ways a lot simpler in, in that space. If... You know, everybody in here are mainly experts. I won't, you know, I won't sort of talk down at all because that's not my place to do that. But in terms of what we do with partners such as Kaspersky, we look to prevent, detect, investigate, and disrupt cybercrime, and we do that in a number of ways. I love the hood that's going on here, by the way. That's good. <laughs> I know who you are. Um, so what what we do, we look under those four areas, and I think law enforcement and modelling law enforcement, we look at how we address cybercrime doesn't work. Um, we work in a national environment, the way that we work to do our investigations. And, you know, police normally get the 999 call, we come along. We do not get those calls at all. And I've been in this area now for about 15 years, effectively. Um, I learned very quickly in the UK, we, we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the capability. I then worked nationally um, on the cybersecurity strategy there, um, looking at how we police that. But again, nothing really. It's on that international stage. So when you look at these attacks, they are global attacks, effectively. And when you look around the vulnerabilities in networks and systems, that's what any threat actor takes advantage of. So how do we reduce those vulnerabilities in systems and networks? And everybody here has some sort of role to play in cybersecurity, in doing prevention work. And we need to try and change that, that language in, in how we operate because... You know, law enforcement is sort of, you know, the end result effectively. And what we need to do is to be a little bit smarter about how we work and how we promote the great work that goes on in the cybersecurity industry in identification of those vulnerabilities and patching them. But also, we have to push the onus back onto some of the companies that, you know, produce this software with known vulnerabilities in there. And this comes back to your point, you know, OSS. It's open source. So, you know, you can't point a finger at someone there effectively. But when you can start pointing fingers is when those vulnerabilities are exploited. And I'll just finish on one little point here, 
is the new US um, national cybersecurity strategy has made two differences. And it's the first time I've seen this in any strategy. The first one, it talks about not putting the onus on individuals and sort of small businesses around, you know, if they, if they make a mistake, it shouldn't be them getting into trouble. They should be protected. And then the second one is looking at regulation around those that provide the software is pushing now some regulation on that side of it. And I think the next three to five years, we're going to be in some very interesting times because normally, you know, what happens in that particular country rolls out across a number of like-minded countries. Mm -hmm. So the litigation side we're potentially going to be getting into in the future when we have such attacks is something we all need to be very conscious of. All right, thank you for that. I think that sort of sets the stage of our discussion today. And I'm going to jump over to um, Ron, because I think we need to start defining that problem even more. Um, and I'm going to ask Ron, what exactly makes supply chain attacks utilizing open source vulnerabilities unique and more difficult to mitigate? Perfect, perfect. So I, I wouldn't even just limit that on open source software. Yeah. We could start even shifting left and going after some of the suppliers. So you pick your favorite microcontroller maker. Most of the vulnerabilities pretty much start there. You can actually go after suppliers as well. I used to buy a lot of hardware from Samsung, and there was uh, developers from this side of the world that were name squatting actual Samsung uh, development studios. And so you can find very interesting things happening on those fronts. But on the open source side, there's kind of several audiences, especially in the critical infrastructure world. You have asset owners that have basically been unconsciously forced to accept that risk to, to have, for example, revenue generating facilities. You have systems integrators who often glue these products together to make bigger things like bottling lineups. Then you have your suppliers, which could be your top tier vendors. And then you also have your suppliers to your top tiers. And most industrial uh, vendors are actually integrators. Like for example, Boeing doesn't build aircrafts, it puts them together. And that's something to think about from the software side. So there's such, such many different aspects to all this. Now, when you take something and you, you think about the old days, quote unquote, you thought of you're dealing with one vendor, maybe two. But when I pop open a lot of hardware and software now, there's over a hundred sub vendors, some of which are open source, some are variations and forks. I mean, Cisco is notoriously difficult for that right now. Look at what just came out. But did you notice that Rockwell did not produce a vulnerability notice for basically uh, rebranded Cisco gear? two, three weeks later, and yet no, your asset owners won't know that, that Cisco IOS is inside, plus the other things which Cisco hides their open SSL usage. So there's so many different subcomponents there, but when you think about patching and why is that hard, it depends on where you are in that tool chain. So how many of you remember Urgent 11? There should be lots of hands here, but there's not, that's okay. <laughs> so Urgent 11 was a, a prop, was a VX workspace vulnerabilities. Now, what was very interesting in that, why there was no patches is that nobody paid for the upgrade path on, on BX work. So all the vendors sat in a room, looked at each other and said, who's going to release this notice first and not tell our customers we didn't pay for any of this support contracts. So patching and, and depending on when you're making products, most of the products are feature based, not maintenance based. And so you wind up with this case where you get stuck with products that you can't patch. Or if you're an OEM, there's actually very few people remaining in that organization that have the ability to also patch and to produce new updates. So there's, there's the, the, the business aspect to it, but there's also uh, resources. There's chances of other things there where products have been end of life uh, and you have to live with that. Or in some cases, industrial world, you have naming problems, which is uh, companies go through a number of acquisitions. So you will never be able to trace the vulnerabilities to those packages, even if you had things that expose the components like software bills and materials and other enrichment. And, or companies will buy products literally for the purpose to, to divest them, to kill them, and actually force the customers to go buy from this other vendor. There's a prime case of that, which was the GE digital sale for Emerson. It was designed by Emerson to go kill a set of products and abandon them. So when we're thinking about software and hardware, it's really complicated, A, to know what's in the soup, and B, actually how to fix it, and also even if you're affected at all, especially the compensating control. So it's a really challenging space to be in. Thank you for that. And you know, it's, 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 the problem is sort of defined now. And I'm going to look to Anton, actually, for any recent examples that you can share with us. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. So uh, the first important question that we should discuss, uh, 
is it necessary to use open source or are there any ways not to use it? So you, the answer is that uh, currently there is no chance not to use the open source because uh, most of libraries, most of code is already written and you should re reuse it or you will just lost the time to market for companies, for developers and so on. And uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of risks of uh, using open source. Uh, you know, we have a special dedicated team which is analyzing the open source uh, which we are using in our products and every uh, week, and every month we find the infected open source libraries, the code which has a different payload. So we detected some libraries which just have the payload to send the statistics who is using the open source code which is hosted on the public repositories. For example, you know, two weeks ago, one uh, hacker, hacker from our bug bounty program reached us and said, so you are using the infected uh, open source library. Uh, we've detected it. Uh, and the main job of this hacker is that he's uh, analyzing all uh, public repositories, find the most popular packets in it, and try to sinkhole the domains which is used by the open source code. Then after sinkholing, he is reaching the vendors and send, uh, say them that they are infected. So, uh, and you know, there are a lot of tons of such packets, but it is a, it's a, it's a good thing because uh, bug bounty programs and uh, yeah. when such researchers receive the vendor, they help to improve their security. But now also we are uh, seeing uh, when there are attacks on vendors and with this destructive uh, code. For example, uh, uh, one month ago, we've detected a very popular packet, which is used, uh, used by millions of users, and there was a real backdoor in it. So that's why uh, one year ago, we made a special service for our clients and for, for everyone who wants to use it. So we are making a special feed of infected open source uh, uh, libraries, codes, and so on. So any kind of vendor can integrate it to CICD uh, pipeline and automatically analyze if there are any uh, payload or infected open source uh, code which is used in the product. And uh, which threats we see? So we see the uh, uh, next threads uh, which are used in the uh, in the um, uh, in the attacks on the open source. In uh, first one is the backdoors which are integrated to the open source code, and also the ransomware. So we've uh, we found some threat actors which infects with the backdoor of the open source projects, and after penetrating the organization network, they install the ransomware in the pipeline of uh, the uh, of the victim so it's a real huge problem everyone uh, is using open source and will use it but uh, currently uh, the industry and the society of cyber uh, experts should think about how about to make a public database for example of infected open source projects and uh, spread all this knowledge to all developers in the whole world to be uh, more safe and more safer to use it. So we are all r ready for it. So if someone is interesting, I said, I, I think that uh, we, uh, we have all necessary colleagues and we can discuss after this panel discussion yeah. how we can make such initiative. So uh, I think it will be very transparent and it is very important right now in our times. Yes, exactly. Thank you for that, Anton. Um, and in fact, for those in the room who are not aware, Kaspersky, he did, Anton did mention about a bug bounty program. Um, Kaspersky has a very widely publicized bug bounty program since launched since March 2018. So, well, that's one of our best practices. And so now we've actually heard, um, so just, just um, sort of a midpoint check. We've heard from the law enforcement point of view. We've heard from the industry. Um, and of course, we have with us Vlada, who, who is from Diplo Foundation, which has done, you know, incredible work in the policy space in many different streams. And of course, Vlada is, is authoritative in, when it comes to anything cybersecurity from Diplo Foundation. So I'm going to just invite um, Vlada to sort of um, explain a little bit how the principle of responsible disclosure works with open source vulnerabilities, um, you know, to inform um, to, you know, do you wait? Do you publish? You know, when do you do this? How do you time it? Um, when the code also belongs to everyone because it's open source, who exactly is in charge? Who decides 
And what are the limits you know, of, of responsibility that OSS developers, software vendors, and regulators actually have? So maybe some remarks from you. It's not fair. You gave me the, the hardest question. Of course, of course. <laughs> So, so uh, just uh, to, sh to tell you the perspective from which I'm coming, Diplo Foundation is, is a training institution, educational institution in this field. And my title is dealing with cyber diplomacy, which sounds schizophrenic a little bit. So if I come towards uh, the, the researchers, they would say, cyber what? If I come towards the diplomats, they would say, what kind of diplomacy? And my wife is usually like, what the hell are you working on? Um, but the point is, uh, we are sort of a... Um, uh, call me a professor, trainer, or whatever. What I try to do is translate, or we try to do is translate technology between, or technological technology governance um, between the diplomats and techie community and others. So we try to explain to diplomats and governments how technology works and what they have to take into account when they do policies. And on the other hand, we try to discuss with communities like yours, what is the role of regulation, diplomacy, international relations in there, connecting the dots. Now, as that role, we have been running a project for quite some time now, five years, which is called, long name, Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior in Cyberspace, which is a global dialogue of companies, tech communities, um, NGOs, governments, on who should do what, who's responsible. So what I'm bringing in front of you, and Kaspersky was one of the participants in that, or is one of the participants in that dialogue, the others are Microsoft, Cisco, Huawei, Mandiant, a number of other companies and, and uh, entities. So what I'm bringing ahead to you is actually some findings. I can't say the agreements, because we're not trying to find the agreement, but some findings and lessons learned. So back to your question. If we put ourselves in the shoes, maybe building on what Anton said, you find the vulnerability as a researcher, which is in open source, let's say in a GitHub code. What do you do? Who do you contact? You could possibly contact the developer directly. There is a good question whether the developer will respond. Yes. In most cases, no. <laughs> you can contact the repository, like the GitHub. They have certain mechanisms to channel the, the request for vulnerabilities. You can certainly contact or use the bug bounty programs. There are some like Hunter Dev in the open so source uh, community. You can maybe come to a CERT and hope that the CERT or FIRST or some of the tech community folks can relay the, the, the information about vulnerability. But the main question is what happens next? Who's responsible to patch it? And that's where we get stuck. So on the one hand, the developers are mainly, as we've heard, th those are the enthusiasts. They're usually not paid. And their argument is like, guys, we are not responsible for a vulnerability in, uh, in our code. Because what I do as a developer, for instance, is take it analogy of creating a food. So I'm creating a nice food for myself. I share the receipt for that food, which I like publicly, and you can use it. You can eat it as well. But guys, I'm not responsible for allergies there. You have to check what's inside if you're going to use it. And particularly if you're put it, going to put it on the market, then you are responsible for what's inside. Yeah. GitHub and the repositories, on the other hand, tend to say we cannot force the users of repositories to patch. What we can do and what they do is we can create tools for them to enable the contact point for vulnerability disclosure, to draft a, a CVD, coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy, um, sometimes even um, apply for the CVEs for some users of those programs. We can track dependencies and when there is a fix, we can try to push it ahead so that the users know that there is a more recent version, but that's about it. We cannot fix. There are certain attempts in the open source community, like the uh, Open Source Foundation, which are trying to produce some sort of a, let's say, PCERT, a product security, or trying to fix vulnerabilities, but that demands funds. Mm -hmm. So they're not responsible either. And then we come to a question of vendor, and I think you mentioned that. So the vendors, the big vendors that are using the open source, are the ones which are actually putting it on the market. And they're the ones that are either creating a benefit for themselves, or they are creating a greater risk that they are either exposing it to a mass market or they're building it to critical infrastructure. So they are the ones that are increasing the risks. And the community typically says they should be the ones who should be more responsible. And back to what, what Greg also said at the beginning, we see that trend in the US um, regulatory framework, in the EU regulatory framework, 
um, in the Emirates and other places where the vendors are probably going to see a bigger pressure. And I'll close with one um, suggestion, and maybe that's also a question, Anton, for you afterwards. To what extent the vendors have the duty when they use the open source, when they hopefully build the as bombs, and when they hopefully um, try to patch for their own product, the open source, to bring it back to the community so that they bring back the patched version to the GitHub or whatever. I leave it to that. Perfect. Uh, uh, it's a really good uh, idea, and we are working in such a way. So if uh, we found some uh, vulnerability in open source uh, uh, library or package, so we are bringing it to community, try to co communicate with the developer and push uh, the patch. But uh, I like examples, and uh, you know there is a little, uh, especially huge uh, shadow open source problem. You know, uh, some developers, they you said uh, how to find that uh, you use a, a vulnerable open source library or something you should analyze the dependencies and see what kind of libraries you are using what code you are using and so on but there is a developer problem uh, sometimes some developers they are not uh, integrating the library to the product they make a copy paste you know they just copy code uh, from open source library and to put it in the product code. So, and after uh, someone discovers vulnerability in the uh, package in the library, they fix it, but the code which was copy pasted uh, from the uh, this library is not fixed in product. So this is a real huge problem. And uh, uh, it's a part of a security development life cycle. If you are using open source, so you should integrate the library because uh, you should see the old dependencies and fix it, but not to copy paste. And uh, back to uh, pushing uh, uh, patches to community, yes, uh, I fully agree that the vendor, if he is using uh, the open source uh, uh, code, uh, and he should, and it, it's uh, his responsibility to push backward to the uh, community if he finds some vulnerability and help, uh, help the developers to fix it. I fully agree with it. Can I just uh, jump in as well? So. When, when you're sort of doing the programming, that you know you, you're, you're following rules effectively. Um, a person is guilty of theft if they dishonestly appropriate property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving them of it. 1968 Theft Act um, in the UK. I understand that as a law enforcement official, I understand every single word. And coming back to the point about diplomacy, um, currently the United Nations they are um, elaborating on a new international convention to counter the use of information and communications technology for criminal purposes. That's going to be the first international crime convention by consensus in over 25 years. So how long has cybercrime been around? Do we have an international definition of it? No. Do we need an international definition of it? Yes. No. So the things that are going on at the moment that start on the grassroots are now at the United Nations. Um, this will be completed next, next year effectively. Then law enforcement and others will have an international definition of some sort which we'll all be starting to work to. Will it be perfect? No. But again, it just starts that basis. And that diplomacy, one of those, I think a lot of countries now have cyber ambassadors. So all of a sudden, you, you, you know, you have an, Denmark have an ambassador based in Silicon Valley. So when you look at that world order and that common structure of how we're set up as national countries and rules and laws, this piece that we all work in now does not apply. Excellent. Don't we just love it when the panelists ask one another questions and it just makes our life so easy. It's great, thank you. Um, and so I think it, it, it leads us to hear from a regulator, of course, and from, well, we're in Phuket's, right? So it's home ground for Tirawut um, as Deputy Secretary General um, from, from NCSA, National Cybersecurity Agency of Talent. I think he's got, um, some thoughts that I think we want to tap on. So my question really for you, Tira Wood, is um, currently, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that there is currently no regulation in this space. And so my question, if, if my assumption is correct, my understanding is correct, my question then is how is and how should responsibility be defined in the regulatory frameworks? Are the features of open source software addressed um, in the way Thailand builds its framework, for instance, is there some learning points you can share? Yeah. Thank you, Shini. Um, 
as a regulator, uh, before answering your question, let me begin with uh, the definition of uh, responsibility. Well, basically, responsibility, uh, the definition in regulatory frameworks uh, rarely depend on specific uh, context. Um, well, the in general, the responsibility refer to the obligations of an entity or individuals to act accordingly with uh, some kind of expectation or standard. In case of open source software, because responsibility share among several number of parties, um, developers, user, as well as um, distributor. So it will be very difficult to assign the responsibility to uh, among these uh, stakeholders. As a result, Clearly, there is no, I mean, no regulatory framework that covers uh, and address uh, and can be applied for uh, open source software. Some of them, I mean, can be, uh, some, of, some of them ad address, but just fragmented or incomplete. Well, um, but despite these challenges, uh, we can address some of the responsibility of open source software in some ways. For example, some jurisdictions might address that the open source software developer might have responsibility for uh, provide some kind of um, um, disclaimer or um, liabilities, or some jurisdictions might uh, require another open source software developer to um, disclose the known or the, I mean, security vulnerability, vulnerability of the software. The other jurisdictions might require the other open source software to provide some kind of qualities and support or as well as the documentation of the software. Well, uh, I just want to mention some of the regulatory frameworks that address um, about open source software. The first one is the European Union's uh, general, general data um, protection regula regulations. This uh, law uh, requires the organization that uh, utilize the open source software to have some kind of criteria to make sure that the software is secure to protect uh, personal data. Well, another law might be from uh, the United States Cyber, in, uh, cyber security and infrastructure security agency or CSAS because they provide a lot of uh, best practices and best uh, recommendations, um, especially for uh, open source software development and um, open source and as well as the, I mean, supply chain risk management. The other foundation that uh, propose a list of a lot of uh, best practices at Linux foundations. They provide best practices for like secure codings, uh, software testings, as well as some kind of, um, um, well, uh, compliant for license. In Thai, unfortunately, we do not have um, some regulation or some law that explicitly address responsibility for open source software, but as a regulator, um, we approach uh, local community or local or national open source community to stick or adhere with uh, some of the, I mean, traditional principle like ac accountability, um, transparency and liability. And, but I, for my last comments, well, in, the, in this meantime, there are a lot of effort to build a more comprehensive and effective law in open source software. Um, we try to engage uh, all the stakeholders in order to uh, get, I mean, in order for the regulation to be, I mean, effective and uh, well accepted by all stakeholders. Thank you. Yeah, so you just mentioned GDPR, and that's a really good example of where you have secondary consequences of legislation. So GDPR actually made um, 
victims who'd suffered a data breach or lost PII, actual victims, but they're also prosecuted. Um, and up to 4% of your global turnover annually, those are the sort of fines, and we've seen some of those cases. So they're trying to do a carrot and a stick approach for that. And in some countries where you have that regulation, it's mandated in the UK, although it doesn't come under GDPR, they've got their own sort of one now. Um, we dealt with many cases where companies, you know, effectively end up being prosecuted, but also because of the data protection regulations rules, information couldn't be shared between agencies. So you think how hard it is anyway in this, when you're in a, when you're in a meeting with the Information Commissioner's Office and law enforcement and other private sector partners, and you're having these coded conversations, well, you're aware of that recent data breach in here. It's like, where? Well, this particular sector. So we have this ridiculous conversation backwards and forwards because we're binded by those rules and regulations. So, you know, some great legislations made or regulations are made but then actually it then stops us doing what we're able to do to help protect those sort of communities regulations must make sense for a law enforcement point of view and i think blada you had something to add on yeah building on that on one hand uh, we have we'll see mushrooming of regulations now and some of them will he have the extraterritorial effects like typically the eu regulation has because of their economy it will influence much of the world um, the question is, how do we synchronize those or harmonize those regulations for the same reason, right? Um, and whether the regulators are actually talking to each other. And that's starting to happen, but it's really slow. Um, some of them are building on the existing standards, like the ISO standards and so on, but there are many other things, such as information sharing, vulnerability disclosure procedures. But there are other things, and as, as Craig said, the problem can emerge if it's over-regulated, then you actually start blocking things. And the other aspect is that you don't have to solve everything with regulation. So we need regulation for some things. We need for that accountability of some actors and to lay down the ground. But there's so many things that we can do with incentives and start with the corporate culture and the, the companies which can put a peer pressure. And then the users, which we usually forget, the users, I mean, we are the worst. We want to buy the cheapest things. We don't care about, well, you, you're a different sort of, but typical <laughs> users don't care. They, they want the shiniest, new, brightest device. They don't care about security. If we would be asking for more security, it would be on the agenda of the companies as well. So there are other ways and security and the regulation has to be mixed with these incentives of all of us. Right, thank you for that. And um, I, I really want to, Ron, you have a comment because I was going to ask you a question, but, but please go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to use SolarWinds as a prime example to that. So they, so SolarWinds is under SEC violations right now for what happened a few years ago. And they lost 10% of their share price uh, overnight, which was quite impressive. But we don't have to necessarily think of cybersecurity. We can look at uh, accountability and due diligence. And in those cases, you have perfect grounds under most legal systems to go after the executives and companies. And that hasn't really happened except for in this case. And so I find, you know, and you point to the quality of products. I use the term indicators of garbage, IOGs. If something really smells, you probably shouldn't buy it. Or you're going to basically look at it like your cost of ownership is going to be 10 times more, especially if you're buying things for a long term. But the SEC part, circling back to that, that is probably the most effective vehicle to implement change on publicly traded organizations. And that will probably drive the majority of vendors who are in a position to, to make a change. Uh, I think that'll be one of the most, when that, when that filing goes through and when, they're, when people will be in the courtroom, I think everyone's heads are going to all go, who's next? And I think that'll be very powerful. So sorry, just as so we're talking courtroom, then VTEC um, had a data breach probably about eight years ago. Um, trust me, you didn't need to be a rocket scientist to get into their systems and networks. One person, um, and he was worried about their security. He was prosecuted. Um, he got a suspended sentence. Everybody thought he was okay. Many went and did it again. But VTEC then had a class action. So coming back to that courtroom, it, that's the stick effect, isn't it, really? And sometimes you have to have that stick effect and make an example of for others to take notice because quite often you only take notice when it directly impacts on you or coming back to your point, the, the bottom line. Sorry, I think that we have everything already uh, from the society uh, for regulation, for open source problem and for supply chain uh, attacks that we have right now. So 
basically uh, there should be a very easy rule. If you are a huge vendor, you are providing uh, your products, any kind of uh, products to uh, government, to enterprise uh, companies, or you have a uh, uh, huge uh, B2C base, for example, more than 1 million or 2 million uh, users, uh, you should implement uh, the security de development life cycle rules. So if you are not using them, so you are not allowed to sell the products to the enterprise segment, the government segment, or have a huge B2C base. So there should be, we have already all rules, we have all necessary recommendations and all technologies to use security development lifecycle, inventory all open source code, make a static analysis of it, fix the vulnerabilities in special uh, dates and so on. So just uh, we should just track it and make uh, the uh, regulatory for it uh, that uh, there should be a sign that this is vendor is using uh, SDL practices. So it's okay he can sell his products uh, to enterprise governments and so on. So everything is ready for it. That's great. Blada, you want to add on to that? Just, just a quick stepping into the shoes of the regulators. We see that there are two primary concerns that the re regulators have. One is the critical infrastructure, and that's the, the becoming more and more critical because cybersecurity is getting to the level of national security, warfare, and everything. So that's one side of regulations where they're particularly cautious what comes into critical infrastructure. And basically, everything can come into critical infrastructure. Every single piece of code and library can be there. And the second one is the user security. And that's where we see the regulatory frameworks like the labeling scheme in, in Singapore, where they're trying to help users be more protected, particularly with IoT and others. So just to distinguish how the regulators see that. Yes. And, and, and also a good idea, uh, we're talking about when everybody unites and help to uh, fix open source problems, also um, uh, rep repository, which will be held by different kind of uh, enterprise companies, government, and so on, uh, on national level. For example, when there will be a special repository where the open source libraries will be placed, and uh, uh, when they are placed to this repository, there is a commit from the developer that he will fix the vulnerabilities, that other companies which are using uh, this code is also supported by them, and in a few years you will have uh, a good uh, repository with a lot of source code which is fully supported by enterprise vendors, by governments, and uh, by the society which is used. So now because uh, everyone uses this, uh, code from different kind of uh, repositories which is not supported. And uh, after a lot of uh, enterprise companies will unite in national level with government's help, there will be a, one repository where everyone can use the supported code. So I think that it also should be discussed on different kind of uh, levels on the regulator level. And uh, in two, three years, uh, we will have uh, a real supported open source repository. And because supply chain is usually of a transnational nature, yeah, I see nods around <laughs> the, the room as well. Um, it is this this cooperation internationally is really important, and I think every single person, every one of you gentlemen on the stage today, have got would, would have lessons to share about international cooperation and its role, um, in particular to this topic that we're discussing today. So starting from maybe Tirawood, maybe you want to share, and then we go down the row, and I think that's a very nice way for us to conclude this discussion when we're talking about the mitigation of you know best practices for mitigations. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want you to tell us what you think um, are the key things, key components of this international cooperation that we're talking about, and you know, is it orchestrated? Is it organic? You know, what are the key elements in this from from your perspective? Well, basically, uh, from my perspective, uh, perspective about international um, cooperations, well, what I have seen is that uh, a lot of country uh, propose a different approach and different method. Some of them are in common and some of them are different. And um, well, the best way to uh, combine this different approach into one single approach is to work in the common ground or common area first and try to um, keep the difference away for the first time because that's going to be, I mean, the the way to build uh, some kind of uh, internal corporations for the first place because there are a lot of 
approach that a lot of country propose uh, in the I mean international arenas and working in the common ground or common area would be the I mean the the good place to start. Vlada. Um, from my head, with with the diplomacy, international relations. On one hand, Craig mentioned the United Nations um, attempt to come up with a, with a global convention on cybercrime or treaty on cybercrime. Let's see how far it's going to go. The mandate is next year. They have to end and uh, early next year. They have to come up to a consensus or get to a voting, which might be nasty. Uh, but there is there is another process which is interesting, which is which existed for twenty something years in the UN, and that's what is called the first committee security guys, basically, uh, discussed uh, the, what the states should do and shouldn't do in times of peace and war. Um, how the international uh, law applies is basically back to what Mauro was discussing the, uh, this morning. Um, and they've come up to a number of uh, uh, cyber norms. They agreed that the existing international law applies, but they also agreed that, for instance, states should not attack each other's critical infrastructure. They should not attack each other's certs or use the certs for the attack. Um, they should work on coordinated vulnerability disclosure and securing the supply chain. And I'm, I'm talking about uh, 193 plus countries that agreed by consensus in this open-ended working group in the UN. The different question is how far that goes in implementation. But the states can go as much as setting those very general agreements. Then it's on us the regulators, the vendors, the community to actually help to implement that on the ground. Uh, and the Geneva Dialogue that I mentioned is one such attempt to get the players together and discuss who is responsible for what, who can do what, and what the regula regulators might need to do and what not. So there is a lot of space, um, but there are some things happening already. Thank you. One thing I think we've made an assumption on is that we should trust developers. There's an implicit thing here, and nobody thinks about it, but like if you take one of the most commonly used mathematical libraries, there's two individuals that are contributing code that are actually operators for a foreign nation. Nobody takes that into account when we think of supply chain. The threat there, what in the code might be completely valid, but they haven't disclosed who they're working for. And another part here is we don't think of developers as exploitable resources in the supply chain, but everybody has a price or has a need that, be, that they can be extorted for. And there's markets actually in Asia designed on getting access to suppliers, such that those suppliers can get introduced into another bigger product and actually amplify their attack uh, framework and also capacities for impact. That is something that very few of us think about in this room, and those that are in the threat intel will be like, wow, I, I possibly didn't think about going after developers and tracking who's uncommitting, who's been taking over abandoned repositories or forking and making it look like you're legitimate um, and staging and basically becoming puppets. So that's something also we need to think about in supply chain, it's not just just because it's open source, it's good. And just because there's eyes on it, are those eyes actually qualified to be making those decisions? And generally speaking, most of the eyes are not qualified to make those things. So when we're thinking about supply chain, there's the legislation, the regulation, but also what goes into these things. And, and that's also something to consider as well, because somebody's going to get indicted at some point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that um, the key element to solve this problem is firstly, uh, all societies uh, should, fi uh, should fix the problem, uh, which is next. There is no a threat model for open source and for supply chain attacks right now. So, for example, we're talking about the critical infrastructure, but uh, is it allowed, for example, if some vendor is making a uh, software uh, for uh, critical infrastructure and uses uh, the open source libraries which are not supported? So threat model for uh, B2C segment, for critical infrastructure, for enterprise will not be the same. So it's uh, completely different. And uh, firstly, there should be the full threat model of using open source in different kind of infrastructures, in different kind of clients. And then there should be a rules and uh, regulatory rules how to use open source in different kind of uh, uh, developers and uh, infrastructures. For critical infrastructure, there should be very strict uh, security development lifecycle uh, measurements. 
And uh, I think that when there will be such document which will uh, describe how to uh, safely use open source uh, and uh, what kind of supply, and, uh, supply chain attacks could be happen if you are using uh, the open source, it will be the solution of part of problems. But currently, we have no such document, we have no such uh, threat model, and I think that in the nearest future, all security societies should start to do it. Because we are talking a lot about the open source, the problems, the threats, which uh, is bringing us to of using uh, the open source. But there is no a document which describes the full threat model. So we should do it. And uh, after it, we will make uh, regulatory rules for different kind of uh, uh, the infrastructures, clients, uh, and uh, all uh, business segments. What kind of pro products could be used and uh, what kind uh, of uh, rules should be done from the developer? So I think it's the first problem that we should solve. Thank you for that. Craig. So I'm going to disagree and agree. Um, for me, it's digital responsibility. Where does the responsibility start? First of all, it starts with a user. So how responsible is a user, first of all? Secondly, then, as a company and organization, how responsible is a company and organization? Then it comes into governments. How responsible is a government? So when we're trying to solve this problem or challenge, we're not going to solve it globally. Regulation, harmonization, we are not going to have that. When we sign up for voluntary norms, etc., at some stage, someone's going to break those norms. So first of all, we need a realistic conversation in this space. It comes back to, you know, why do we have police and law enforcement because back thousands of years ago something was going on with those societies disagreed with so that's how law enforcement was created so we're going through this evolution if you like now and we're creating communities to protect communities the community sat here protect the other communities as well but we're doing it now on a, a crime type that is global. When people say cybercrime is borderless, I scream because for us as law enforcement, no, we're totally constrained by our borders. So I think we need to be very realistic to start with about, yeah, we're going to have harmonization, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. The EU can do certain bits because, you know, they've got 27 countries. But it comes back to how do I protect my sons? We got there, we're going to wait for the waterfall, he said. Um, how, how do I protect my children? protect my mum? How do I protect the people I care for online effectively? Right, thank you. And with that, actually, I think um, we've got, we've had an excellent discussion on securing supply chains in the open source era. Um, and I think we've heard views from a very good um, representation of, of our community today and also a very global panel that we have today. Just want to ask you to join me in applauding this wonderful panel. <laughs>